Live from Brooklyn, it's Monday night. And I'd love to introduce the crew to you. We have Mr. Donald Culp from Columbus, Ohio. Hello, everybody. And then we have Mr. John Tudor from Nashville, Tennessee. Yes, right here in Nashville. Hello, people. And then uh, Mr. Michael and um, Miss Dana um, aren't here tonight. They, um, Michael had a class, he has to, he's an, an electrical um, person and he's teach teaches his class on electricity to a bunch of apprentices and so he's there tonight. But we're back in Brooklyn and I'm still dodging bullets. <laughs> And the car horns. Oh. Oh well. John, you want to uh, open us up with a word of prayer? Yeah, sure. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your gracious love and your goodness to us each and every day. Your love just overflows, and it is just wonderful, Father, to be a partaker of that great love. And thank you, Father, that each day we can talk to you because of what your son Jesus Christ did for us. And I'm just so thankful in my heart that I can have that relationship with you and be able to enjoy that wonderfulness of yours in my life and in my heart and in my being and understanding with everything that you have given me. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your commitment, for your love, for your just hanging on to the word of God, that word of truth, and and presenting, presenting it not only to the people back then, but to the people now as you have been resurrected uh, out from among the dead by your Father. We're thankful, God. We're thankful, Lord Jesus, for your continuing ministering to us each and every day and we thank you so much for your for your for your how you went through the cross and endured the pain and suffering for us so thank you for this evening for the teaching tonight and for the wonderful wonderful people who may be blessed by this word thank you father in the name of your wonderful son jesus christ amen Amen. Amen. Well, Mr. Donald is going to reshare the word that uh, kind of got lost in the shuffle <laughs> this week when I uh, froze and the whole system crashed. So take it away, Mr. Donald. All right. Thank you, Donald. <laughs> All right. Uh, I got some background noise from somewhere. Okay. Can you guys turn down the TV a little? Okay. Uh, last, uh, when I go visit my dad, uh, I love my dad. He's the best. He and I can strike up a conversation about the Bible and talk for hours. It's, it's really very cool. And we don't always agree on everything, but we love each other and we don't throw things at each other. We don't get mad at each other. We can, we can carry on an intelligent conversation and uh, still love each other at the end. And it's the last couple of times I've been talking to him, the topic has been uh, the Trinity. Uh, he is a Trinitarian. I am a non-Trinitarian. And we both have our reasons. And they're all scriptural. And this may not be uh, what I share tonight might not convince you, and it, but it might. But uh, these conversations and back and forth have been going on for centuries. Uh, 
it's just uh, a, a difficult topic to uh, change. Once you have uh, been raised a certain way and with a certain belief, it's very difficult to change, even if you see it in the scripture sometimes. And a lot of the times, uh, things that we think are in the scriptures are not in the scriptures. And things that, and things like that really create problems. But anyways, uh, part of the problem is when people who are Trinitarians uh, come to people who are not Trinitarians, it's very, oh, it's, everybody wants to try to convert the person they're talking to and the person they're talking to wants to convert them. And so everybody has their texts that they bring up and then they have their texts that they bring up. And it turns out being a, a, a match to see who can remember the most scripture. <laughs> and it can get very frustrating very fast. Uh, one of the things that comes up is, uh, Trinitarians or non-Trinitarians will uh, come off right off and say, well, the word Trinity is not in the Bible. And it isn't. The word Trinity is not in the Bible. Uh, the, hang, hang on here a second. The word Trinity is not in the Bible. That is true. This is a true statement. Uh, the Trinitarians are now coming back and saying, well, you know, the word Bible is not in the Bible either. And that is not true. That is false. And it's actually in the Bible 13 times. And it is the Greek word biblios means book. And it is one of the verses that you can find it in is in Matthew chapter one, verse one, the very first verse of the New Testament. Mm -hmm. And it says the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. There you go. It's in there. It's also on the cover of just about every Bible. Just about every Bible has a, it says the Bible. <laughs> so anyways, uh, so I thought I'd just clear that up, get that out of the way. Uh, but the, the verses that are so uh, relied upon by Trinitarians that have them in such a, a firm position is Chapter 1 of John. <clears throat> so, that's where I'd like to start reading. Uh, in particular, two verses. Uh, the first verse and the 14th verse of the first chapter of John. And in the first verse, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So, according to that verse, we know that uh, from other verses of the Bible, like Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, where it says, in the beginning God created the heavens and earth. God was in the beginning. So in the beginning was the Word. So in the beginning was God. So we have a, uh, so if, if God was in the beginning and God was the Word, and the Word was in the beginning, then God is the Word. And it says in the rest of the verse, in the Word was God. So there you go. So, and then in verse 14, it says, and then the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So Trinitarians will say, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was God. The Word was made flesh. Okay. 
God became a man. God became flesh and dwelt among us. End of story. Jesus is God in the flesh. How can you miss that? And the reason is because there are numerous problems with this. We know that God does not lie. He does not say one thing one place and something someplace else. There, he has a purpose for everything he says, where he says it, when he says it, how he says it, to whom he says it, and why he says it. Uh, every word in the word is truth. God's word is truth. And some of the problems that we have with God being Jesus is simply that, well, God is invisible. But Jesus was visible. He was seen by many people. Uh, God cannot be tempted. The Bible says God cannot be tempted. But Jesus was tempted in all points like we are, yet without sin. How can Jesus be God and be tempted and God cannot be tempted? That is a, a brain knot right there. Uh, God cannot die. Jesus died on the cross. And then God, who cannot die, raised him from the dead. Hello? God is spirit. Jesus is not a spirit. Jesus is a man. God had a beginning. Or God had no beginning. But Jesus had a beginning. And we know this from the Word. And I'd just like to read this one. John, uh, Psalms 90, verse 2. Psalm 90, verse 2, these are all from the King James Bible, in case you're wondering, uh, says, Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hadst formed the earth, before you even formed the earth in the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. No beginning, no ending. He's, he is eternal. But we know from Matthew chapter 1, and in verse 18, it says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was in on this wise, or in this manner. When as his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. This was how Jesus began. The word birth, the Greek word for birth here, is Genesis. In all the oldest manuscripts, the, the word here is Genesis. And that's uh, uh, um, the Greek word 1078, if you're looking. And uh, however, there is another word that's the word for birth, and that's genesis, spelled the same as Genesis, only with one extra N. And that is of a later, uh, it's in later manuscripts, not in the older manuscripts, but in the newer manuscripts the more some of them are not as old, therefore not quite, you know, we always are trying to go back and get the oldest possible sources we can. And the oldest possible sources tell us that the word used for birth in this verse is Genesis. Genesis means beginning. That's how, where they got the word Genesis for the book of Genesis, the beginning. Um, the word birth is a little more specific. It just means uh, the birth. And uh, there's a lot written on this, and I'd like to read some of this from the uh, REV commentary. Uh, here it talks about the word birth. The Greek noun is Genesis. Uh, 1078 is the number for that word. All these uh, Greek words have uh, a G in front of them for Greek. Uh, the Hebrews have, the Old Testament ones have a different letter from them, so designate that they were Hebrew. Uh, but the number 1078, you can look it up, is Genesis. Strictly speaking, it means origin, source, or beginning. Um, and these are pretty reliable sources. Everybody agrees on these definitions. It's from the verb genomai, another Greek word, uh, which means to become or to come into existence or begin to be. That is a root word of Genesis. Genesis is formed from the word genomai. We get our English word Genesis from Genesis, 
Genesis also became used for that which flows from what is begun. And is used for nature sometimes, natural. Since we usually think of the birth of a person as his or her beginning, Genesis was used by the Greeks of birth. However, there is a much more accurate Greek word for birth, and that's genao. And the nouns associated with it are genetos, genetos, meaning born, and genesis, meaning a birth. These two words, Genesis and Genesis, are very similar. If you notice, there's only one difference, the N in Genesis. There's two of them instead of just one. Otherwise, they're spelled pretty much the same. And uh, although the earliest and best Greek texts have Genesis as the word used, some later manuscripts have Genesis. Interesting. And it goes on and says, although the substitution of Genesis for Genesis in these more recent manuscripts uh, may have been accidental, uh, it might also have been purposeful. There is reason to believe, or some people think that it's, it could be purposeful. Heaven forbid, I don't know, you hate to think that people would do things like this, but there's evidence that tampering goes on. Trinitarian scribes may have uh, been uncomfortable with the idea that Jesus had an origin and that it was when God impregnated Mary and so might have, they might have substituted what was to them a much clearer word for birth, genesis, um, which would then clearly make the subject of Matthew 118 be only his birth and not his real beginning. Okay, the word Genesis points to the fact that God impregnating Mary not only led to Jesus' birth, but was in fact his origin or beginning. So you can see where this is going. He had been in the mind, Jesus had been in the mind of God from before the foundation of the world. First, first Peter, I think, 1.20 says that. Uh, but did not exist did not exist in any form except as part of God's plan in his mind. When God impregnated Mary, Jesus began in reality, to, took his first breath, and was not just in the mind of God. Other things happen when we start getting into, did Jesus exist before he was born? And when you start getting into some of these areas, Trinitarians have to come up with new words that are not in the scriptures to describe their beliefs. And so if Jesus was born or existed before he was born, then, so if Jesus existed before he was born, then the theological term that they came up with is pre-existence, right here, pre-existence. It's a coined word to support, the, to support the doctrine of the Trinity and describe Jesus' state before his birth. But it's not in the Bible. It's not in the Bible. When we're talking about ver words that aren't in the Bible, well, the word Bible's in the Bible. Trinity is not. Pre-existence is not. And if we you keep on reading down here, pre-incarnate is not in the is not in the Bible. Uh, these are all things that that happen as a result when you start getting in the weeds, in our opinion. Okay. Uh, there is no other verse of scripture anywhere outside of Matthew 118. It says that Jesus was conceived at any other time or place than when he was conceived in the womb of Mary. Then doesn't exist. Trinitarians will say that Jesus was eternally begotten. Eternally begotten. Now, they have to come up with these terms because they believe he existed before he was born, before he was begotten. So they come up with this term that he is eternally begotten. 
But that is also an invented term and unsupported by scripture. Eternally begotten is a nonsense term. We can use the word nonsense because anything begotten or born had a time at which it was born. Nothing eternal is born. If Jesus is eternal, then he was never born. If he was born, then he is not eternal. It's one or the other. Both does not, uh, is, is not an option. Okay. That leads us to another proof that Jesus did not exist before his conception in the womb for Jesus to be the begotten son. There had to be a mother. If Jesus was eternally begotten or born at any other time besides when Mary gave birth to him, then who gave birth to him? Jesus cannot be eternally begotten or even begotten as the first of God's creation if no one gave birth to him. Begotten means born. All right, so this goes on. This is the, the way that uh, the conversation goes and the reason we feel so strongly about the being non-Trinitarians is we try to stick with Scripture. Trinitarians have a tendency to make up words that do not belong in the Scriptures or that are not in the Scriptures to back up their explanations. And it makes it a little weak. Okay. All right, back to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word. So when we start questioning, you know, the, these understandings, then we have to dig deeper into the Scriptures. The Word wasn't originally written in English. It was written in Greek or Aramaic. We have a lot of Greek manuscripts available to us, and it's an easy way to get started is, uh, Find out what the Greek word is behind the English word. Dig below the surface. Then when you do, in the beginning was the word, and the Greek word for word is logos. We get a lot of words from the word logos. Logical, uh, dialogue, um, uh, uh, biology, ology, logos, ology, uh, the study of whatever, biology, study of life. Um, so you can see the word logos has a, it really does have a wide variety. It's, I think it's translated, it occurs over 300 times in the New Testament, over 300 times. And it's only used to, to refer to Jesus like seven times out of all that. Really? So, well, maybe this is referring to something else. So, verse 14, we, we read, And the word, logos, was made flesh and dwelt amongst us. Okay, so this, the word for word in all of these, in both of these two verses, is always the word logos in all of them. So, my question then is, what was made flesh? Was God made flesh? I have a problem with that. Was the Logos made flesh? Now, well, that's a possibility. Let's look into that. So let's see what we got here. King James translates Strong's G3056, that's Logos, as a word 218 times, saying 50 times, account 8 times, speech 8 times, Word, as in Christ, seven times, there you go. Thing five times, and a whole bunch of other ways, about 34, 38, 37 different ways from there on. There's a whole bunch of words. So uh, in this little outline, it says uh, it could be a form of speech, a word uttered by a living voice, embodies a concept or an idea. Uh, it's what someone has said. It's a word, the sayings of God, a decree, a mandate, moral precepts given by God, Old Testament prophecy given by the prophets, uh, what is declared, a thought, declaration, aphorism, a weighty saying, a dictum, a maxim, uh, 
Now, I've been in churches, and <clears throat> somebody will say, I have a word. I have a word of knowledge. I would like to speak. I have a word. And they use the word, word, to imply that they have a message. <clears throat> and that is an accurate use of the word. But look here, it says Old Testament prophecy given by the prophets. Uh, in the Old Testament, uh, the word of the Lord came to Isaiah. The word of the Lord came to uh, Jeremiah. The word of the Lord came to Moses. The, the word uh, came to these guys. Okay. So uh, it also refers to prophecy. Now, this gets real interesting. Look at this. John 1, 1 and 1, 14. The word for word is logos. Now, prophecy in the Old Testament is a word from God. But look here in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians is laying out here in verses 8, 9, and 10, the manifestations of the Spirit. Revelation and manifestations. For to one is given by the Spirit, by God, the word of wisdom. The word of wisdom. The logos of wisdom. That's the word logos. Interesting. To another, the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. Word of knowledge. That's logos. Uh, to another, faith by the same Spirit. Gifts of healing by the same Spirit. Working miracles. Prophecy. Hmm. To another, discerning of spirits. To another, diverse kinds of tongues. And our interpretation of tongues. So now we have a connection here between logos and prophecy. Now, it said in the beginning was the word, was the logos, was the prophecy. Do you know what the first prophecy in the Bible was? First of all, what is a prophecy? It says here in Strong's, the word prophecy is the word, the Greek word, prophetia, prophetia, prophecy. It's a discourse emanating from divine inspiration, a declaring the purposes of God. Interesting. Whether by reproving and admonishing the wicked or comforting the afflicted or revealing things hidden, especially by foretelling future events. Sounds like prophecy. Yeah. Okay. The prediction of events relating to Christ's kingdom. Things related to Jesus Christ, predictions, okay. All right, well, the first, okay, here's a couple of verses before we get to the first prophecy. These are prophecies. Look at this, Luke one twenty. And behold, thou shalt be dumb, unable to speak, and not able to speak, until the day that these things shall be performed, because thou believest not my words, logos, which shall be fulfilled in their season. So here, the word logos actually refers to a prophetic message. Uh, Luke 29, 1, 29, And when she, Mary, saw him, the angel, she was troubled at his saying, at the logos, the words that he was saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation it should be. Hmm. A couple more, Luke twenty two sixty one, 61, And the Lord turned and looked upon Peter. This is Jesus looked upon Peter, and Peter remembered the word, the logos, the foretelling of the Lord, how he had said unto him, unto Peter, before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. Hmm. So a, a word of prophecy here is called the logos. Yep. One more, that the saying the prophecy of Isaiah, the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report, and to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? There is another one. So the first prophecy in the Bible is the plan of salvation. And it's in one verse, Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it, the baby, shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. 
This is the first prophecy in the Bible. You could say it is a word, and it is in the beginning, and it is foretelling of the coming of Jesus Christ sometime in the future. Okay, back here. So, what was made flesh? Hmm, and what dwelt among us? Was it God? The Trinitarians will say God was made flesh and dwelt among us. But that's not what the scriptures say. It says the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Okay? So, if a Word is from God, it's God. I heard from God today. You know? Oh, well, what's a word? You know, you know, people here. I mean, it's it's the same thing. Uh, the word was with God. The word was God. Okay, the word was made flesh. Okay, the scriptures say that the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. What was the word? It was the very first prophecy recorded in the scriptures in the beginning, circa Genesis chapter three, and it took place in the Garden of Eden. You could easily say Genesis 3.15 occurred in the beginning. It wasn't the first day, but it was while they were still in the Garden of Eden. You got to say, well, that's got to be in the beginning. Anything that happened during the time anybody was in the Garden of Eden uh, would qualify as being in the beginning. Okay. So what was made flesh? Genomai, the word here. For made flesh was made, says, and the, this is amazing. This is all in these two verses. Verse 14, and the word was made flesh. It was made flesh. The, the Greek word for was made flesh is ginomai. We just talked about that. Ginomai. G1096. It literally means to, for something to begin or to come to pass. So here, you could literally say, verse 14 is saying, the prophecy came to pass and dwelt among us. And I think that is exactly how that is to be understood. The prophecy came to pass. The baby was born. It grew up and dwelt among us. Hallelujah. <laughs> I just think that's I just think that's awesome. It's from the scriptures. There's no guesswork. It's 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 not false. You can read into the the other stuff if you want to, but I just think that this is a much more accurate way of believing the scriptures. The word genomai means, this is right out of Blue Letter Bible, to become or to come into existence. Uh, to begin to be, receive, to become, to come to pass, to happen, uh, appear in history, come upon the stage. You weren't on the stage until you came upon the stage, and then you were there. It came to pass. Uh, Here's some other uses of the word genomai. Now all this was done, came to pass, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet. Matthew 26, 56, but all this was done, came to pass. Why? That the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. And all the disciples forsook him and fled. Mark 6, 21, and when a convenient day was come, <clears throat> In other words, the convenient day had not existed yet. It came to be that Herod, on his birthday, made a supper to his lords. <clears throat> his birthday hadn't come yet. A convenient day was his birthday. Okay. All right. Now, what else do I want to do here? Hang on. Got to get to another screen. Mm -hmm. All right. So, genomai means to, basically means to come into existence. Uh, here we have verse 
14, and the Word was made flesh, John 1, 14, and the Word was made, you know, my, it came into being and was made flesh. It came into being. It was, it did not exist before this. And then it dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, uh, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Awesome. The next verse, John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake. He that comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. Well, John the Baptist was born six months before Jesus. So how can John the Baptist say, before me, he was before me? And, and it says, he that comes after me is preferred before me. And the word preferred is the key. He's preferred before me. He was before me. John came in into the scene or on the scene much later than Jesus. Jesus was on the blueprint long before John the Baptist was. Jesus was prophesied of in Genesis 3.15, in the beginning, everything was about Jesus Christ. He was preferred before all the other prophets. But Jesus did not come into existence until six months after John. So being preferred before him, he was before me in preference. Yeah. Okay. First John. Go to First John. John wrote three more books. Three more books. And we can get a little more information from John in these other three books uh, about the first book of John, the Gospel of John. And it says here in First John chapter 1 and in verse 1, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life. And he's talking about Jesus Christ here. God's invisible. Look at what it says here. Jesus, he, we've seen him with our eyes. We've looked on him, looked at him. We, they've handled, they've held him. Uh, for the life was manifested and we have seen it. And bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father, how? In God's plan, in his thought. And show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested, came into being, came into actual existence unto us, was manifested unto us. They were the fortunate ones who happened to be on the earth when Jesus was alive. Very cool. That which we have seen, verse 3, that which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you, that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with who? The Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus is the Son of God. How could he be God and the Son of God? You cannot be the son of somebody until you have been, until that person has a son. God did not have a son before he begot Jesus. Didn't, Jesus wasn't there until God begot him. Uh, I don't know how to make that any clearer, but God will here in a few short verses. Uh, verse 4. And these things write we unto you that your joy may be full. Okay, let's go on to chapter four. John, first John, chapter four. First John, chapter four. Let's go back up here to the beginning. First John, chapter four says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits. Check them out, whether they are of God or not. Because many false prophets are gone out into the world. So we need to be aware of that. Hereby know we the Spirit of God. Okay, here's how you tell. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus is God is 
and God has come in the flesh is of God. Is that what that says? No. It's not it's what that says at all. It says, every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. So why do people say that we are not of God? I don't know. I don't get it. We believe Jesus Christ came in the flesh. Now there's more to this coming in the flesh. Uh, John talks about this coming in the flesh. He can't talked about it in John chapter one. He talks about it here. And we have to understand the text as it was written at the time it was written. And at the time it was written, there were these people called docetics. And I want to read you something about them. And this is in the One God, One Lord book. One God and One Lord. And it says here that um, it is quite fair to ask why John would say the word became flesh. A statement that seems so obvious to us. Of course, Jesus Christ was flesh. We believe that. Everybody, I think, that believes in Jesus Christ believes he was in the flesh. Okay. Uh, he was born, he grew, he ate, he slept, and Scripture calls him a man. However, what is clear to us now was not at all clear in the early centuries of the Christian era. Um, at the time of John's writing, a, the docetic movement was gaining disciples inside Christianity. Docetic comes from the Greek word for to seem or to appear. Docetic Christians believed Jesus was actually a spirit being or God who only appeared to be human. Okay. Some docetics did not believe Jesus even actually ate or drank, but only pretended to do so. Furthermore, some Jews thought that Jesus was an angel. In theological literature, theologians call this angel Christology. John 1.14 was not written to show that Jesus was somehow pre-existent and then became flesh, but rather it was to show that God's plan for salvation, Genesis 3.15, the coming of the baby, was to show that God's plan for salvation came, became flesh, was born became a reality. Jesus was not a spirit, a God, or angelic being, but rather a flesh and blood man. A very similar thing is said in 1 John 4, 2, that if you do not believe Jesus has come in the flesh, you are not of God. So that is why, or one of the reasons why, this uh, is mentioned here about Jesus being in the flesh. He was actually a flesh and blood Human being, okay? A little different than just a regular human being because he was a second Adam. And uh, that's a whole other teaching, but it's very rich and very appropriate for this topic because we know that the virgin birth or th was when and how the second Adam was born. Jesus, the second Adam. He was born with all the attributes of the first Adam. He was God's masterpiece. In first in the in Genesis chapter one, every day at the conclusion of creation of every day, God ended the day by saying, and it was good. The evening and the morning was it was good. And it was the first day or the the, and everything that he had done that day was good. And the, and the evening and the morning was the second day, so on and so forth. But he created man in his image. He created Adam and Eve on the sixth day, on the sixth day. And when that day ended, he said it was very good. Now, that's saying something for God to say something that he did was very good. Man was his crown jewel. It was the Mona Lisa. It was the, his masterpiece. Adam was awesome. 
and then uh, and God intended for him to live forever, him and Eve, and create a race of people that would live on the earth forever. But how soon things changed. The serpent came on the scene and talked Eve into believing that, you know, you're really not going to die if you eat of the tree. And she believed him, ate. She gave it to, she told Adam, Adam ate. So what are you going to do? you just going to let them die and start over? Well, God didn't think that was the right thing to do. Adam and Eve, they were his masterpiece. It was the masterpiece. So he came up with a, a way to save mankind. Save them from death, sin, and death. Consequences of sin and death. It could save them from death. And the problem was going to be solved by sending a baby, another Adam, and he would grow and he would uh, expose the devil and make an open show of him and kick him around from here to there and beat him and take back what Adam and Eve forfeited to him. And so that's what the plan of salvation is all about. The reason they didn't die that day is because there was a substitute. The animals, God clothed Adam and Eve with animal skins. Those skins didn't just say, oh, I have an extra. No, they sacrificed their life. And that was the first shedding of blood in the Bible. And it was to save Adam and Eve from dying that day. Something had to die that day, and something did. The animals died in their place. Innocent, totally innocent. Were they a perfect sacrifice? No. And that's why Adam and Eve eventually did die. Uh, they didn't know how to die. That's why they lived so long. Shoot, now. You, how, do, how does one die? You turn on the radio, you turn on the TV, walk down the street. Uh, it's everywhere. Uh, Adam and Eve, they just didn't know how to die. Um, so the plan for salvation became a reality when Jesus was born and became flesh. Okay? Every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should become, that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. First John 4, 4, you are of God, little children, and have overcome them, them who, those antichrists, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Amen, brother. Verse 5, they are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world hears them. Unfortunately, yes, they do. We are of God. He that knows God hears us. He that is not of God hears not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Okay, it spells it out right there. Pretty good. Verse 7, Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God. It says in, earlier in chapter 1, God is love. Therefore, love is of God. And everyone that loves is born of God and knows God. He that loves not God... He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. There you go. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent himself. He came down and uh, became a man, and that we might live through him. No, that's not what it says. It says, in this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten son into the world. He sent his son into the world that we might live through him. Trying to get this Trinity doctrine in here, but it just isn't quite fitting. Verse 10, here in his love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and, and came down here and was the payment for us. No, it doesn't say that. 
and he sent his son to be the payment, the propitiation. It's a big word for payment, down payment for our sins. Verse 11. Beloved. Beloved of God, beloved. Beloved, God just loves us more than we love ourselves. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwells in us, and his love is perfected in us. Hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us, because he hath given us of his spirit. Woohoo! All right! Qui sait qui est par la Kunta Saramar? Yep, buddy, there it is. He has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent. Yeah, he sent his son. He didn't come down here all by himself. Don't make me come down here. That's not what happened. He sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is God, God dwells in him and he in God. No, it does, it just doesn't say that. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwells in him and he in God. Amen. Verse 16, and we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love. He that dwells in love dwells in God and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so will we be in the future in the kingdom. No, it says, as he is, so are we right now in this world. Whoa! Yes, sir. Verse 18, there is no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear, because fear hath torment. He that fears is not made perfect in love. Yeah, got to get rid of kick that fear to the curb. We love him because he first loved us. Amen. Just like as if you were drowning, somebody came out and saved you. Man, you didn't love them before they saved you from drowning, but after they saved you, oh, yeah, what can I do for you? You just name it. You want me to be somewhere? You need this? You need that? You just call me. Call me. Call me. You saved my life. Same. We love him because he first loved us. If a man says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he that loves not his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God who he has not seen? Yeah. And this commandment have we from him. This is, a, a, this is a commandment. Okay, so this is something we need to do. That he who loves God, love his brother also. All right. Next chapter. I'm just going to read a couple more verses here. This is the, the creme de la creme. This is the... The what's your favorite dessert? Mine is strawberry shortcake. All right, or it's tough cheesecake with strawberry topping is also oh my, it's awesome. But this verse is even better. Verse one, first John five, verse one whosoever, whosoever means what means whosoever, whosoever believes that Jesus is God is what. New. It says, whosoever believes that Jesus is the Christ. What does that mean? Christ means the anointed one, the Messiah, the Mashiach. Uh, he's the Messiah, the coming Redeemer. That's what that means. Whosoever believes that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, is born of God. And everyone that loves him, that begat, Everyone that loves him, that begat, that word him should probably have a capital letter on it. Everyone that loves him, that begat, loves him also, that is begotten of him. Could it be any plainer? How? I don't know. That, that verse is just awesome. 
By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. For whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory. Here you go. Here's the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcomes the world, but he that believes? Who, okay, who is he that overcomes the world? But he that believes that Jesus is who? The Son of God. Amen and amen. So what became flesh and dwelt among us? The prophecy became a reality. It came to pass. Jesus came into existence just as he was prophesied 4,000 years earlier. He came, he was tempted in all points like we are, yet was without sin. He became the perfect sacrifice for us. Now all we have to do to have that life everlasting with him and his Father is to believe that he is Lord, that he is the Christ, that he is our Lord, and that God raised him from the dead. And he that believes that, you're saved. What a great, what a great message. What a great word of God. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to be the payment for our sins, to, to save us from death. Father, we are, are so grateful. We love you. We thank you. We praise you all day long for all that you do for us, for your goodness to us. And we're just so thankful. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. And that's all I got. Amen. That was pretty good, Don. That was great, in fact. You really, thank you. I mean, so many fundamental truths in there. People overlook. Mm -hmm. Hopefully that makes believing that Jesus is the Son of God a little easier. A little easier to understand maybe why we believe what we believe. So if if you got that, then my job is done. <laughs> and it does it calls Jesus Christ the Son of God many times. It never called him God the Son once. Not once. No. Nope. And they're not synonymous. No, they aren't. If words have meanings, they're not synonymous. So, and it's it's just another way, another phrase, another line that has to be concocted, frankly, to back up their their understanding of what they're reading, which we believe is incorrect. And Amen. You know, the truth will set you free. So that's what we're after. We just want to set people free. We, we want to know the truth. That's, that's all. That's the bottom line. That's right. Well, it's a little bit on the late side. So I think we're going to call an end to things right now. Mm -hmm. So we'll see you all next week. Mm -hmm. Good night. Good night. Good night, everybody.